Look what the cat drug in. That would be Travis Maine, my friend from Ohio. Glad you could make it. We'd like to express our appreciation for you hosting this lectureship. We're indeed excited about coming down here and and sharing the word of God with the people here at the at the Church of Christ here in Roger Springs. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. And uh, we hope that everybody is uplifted and enlightened through all of this. I won't go into a whole lot about the preacher's files lecture or the preacher's files. That's a website where you can uh, get online and ask questions and get answers and have discussions with preachers from all over the world. Uh, if you have never heard of that, then I encourage you to if you if you're an online kind of a person and you spend any time on the internet then that would be www.preachersfiles.com it's got a, a forum it's got uh, an archive of lessons sermons that you can use or studies that you can that you can read it's just got a whole lot of stuff there online free for anybody who wants it the topic this year of the lectureship is you can be sure and before we get started, if you want to uh, open your Bibles to Romans 1, 18 through 20, that's where we're going to start this afternoon. Romans 1, 18 through 20. And while you're turning to that, I'll say that uh, I'm going to make a statement here. We can be sure about every aspect of our faith. We don't have to go through our lives blindly believing the things that we believe. There is evidence and there is things to support the way we believe. Christians are not a bunch of blind blind people that have blind faith who just believe in some kind of, of pie in the sky. And I want, to, I want to make this statement and I believe that it will get more clear as this lesson goes forward. It takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. Did you know that? It takes more faith to be an atheist than it does a Christian. The faith in what? We're going to look at that as this lectureship goes on. It takes more faith to be an atheist, to not believe in God, than it does to believe in God. The topic that I have been asked to speak on here is that you can be sure about the existence of God. Now if you've followed along in the Bible there, we're going to start at Romans 1, 18 through 20. <clears throat> and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Starting in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let me read that last, that last bit again. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God expects all mankind to recognize His existence through observation of what He created. Paul wrote that His existence and eternal power has been clearly evident since the beginning of the creation, defining the creation as the world in which we live contained within the observable universe. In other words, the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, etc., etc. God simply said the things that are made. We are going to call this the universe. God said that His existence has been so evident 
that all those who refuse to acknowledge this and find themselves standing in shame before the judgment seat will be unable to plead a case based on ignorance of God because He has clearly shown His eternal existence, nature, and power in His creation. God says that He will not accept ignorance as an excuse. Now when we peel all the layers off of this and we get right down to the core issues, do Christians have objective or subjective faith? Is our faith objective, which means based on facts and not influenced <coughs> by personal feelings, or is our faith subjective, which means it's based on feelings, attitudes, opinions, whimsical hopes? That's a subjective faith. Jesse Ventura the governor of Minnesota once made a statement in an interview where he said religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people. God says this is not true. God says that faith in His existence is something clearly proclaimed throughout His creation and that people like Mr. Ventura are going to have no excuse. Everybody has faith in something. Mr. Ventura has faith, but it clearly isn't in God. The atheists have faith that everything in the observable universe came about as a result of purely naturalistic processes which brought about the creation of everything in the universe. The atheist denies anything supernatural. So then, whose faith is really based on observable fact, objective, and then whose faith is really based on feelings, attitudes, opinions, and whimsical hopes? As subjective. I will submit for consideration this afternoon that a faith based on observable facts is the faith that we should build our hopes on and not faith based on feelings, attitudes, and opinions. What we think is right. The purpose of this lesson is to consider some of the most basic fundamental facts that support our faith in God and to see whose faith really is based in fact and whose is only a crutch for the weak-minded. To do this, we need to keep in mind that these observable facts have been built into God's creation since the beginning. The first people who ever walked on the earth were expected to be able to see this and draw the conclusion that God existed, that He exists. One would think that with all the passing millennium, with all the technological advancements that we have, and with all our accumulated scientific knowledge, that something as apparent as God and His eternal power that was said to have been clearly evident since the beginning would be all the more easy to see today. You'd certainly think that, but obviously is not the case. There are none so blind as those who will not see. Does God exist? Can we be sure of His existence? Atheists and agnostics say no. Christians say yes. Atheists claim the universe and everything in it came about as a result of natural processes over vast amounts of time. Christians say in the beginning God created. So we have two models here that we can examine. One model says the universe was created. The other says it came into existence naturally without any outside help at all. Now it's important in our examination of this that in order for the universe to exist according to the atheists or those who believe there is no God, there can be no supernatural intervention whatsoever. None. No God, no creator, no higher being who was able to operate outside the laws of nature in order to bring about the universe we live in. There can be no God, no creator, if atheism is the truth, no supernatural, nothing. It has to be natural from the front to the end. So how did the universe get here? To answer that question, we need only look at three options. <clears throat> there are only three that are available to explain the, the, the existence of the universe. Number one, the universe has always existed. In other words, it's always been here. Number two, the universe created itself out of nothing. Or number three, the universe was created. That's really the only three answer, the only three questions that we can really apply to this. Anybody ever hear of the law of exclusion? 
It states that when given all the available options, when the impossible has been eliminated, what remains must be the truth. So if we can look at all three of these options, if we can eliminate two of them, logically and scientifically, then what remains must be the truth. So let's start with number one. Is the universe eternal? Now keep in mind that if there is no God and everything came about by natural processes, like the atheists would like to say, then we must operate within the laws of nature. We cannot step outside the boundaries of the natural if there is no God. The instant we have to rely on something supernatural in order to answer these questions, the discussion is over. The atheists can pack their arguments away and they can go home. You cannot have anything supernatural if there is no God. Scientists have observed the manner in which all matter behaves and has given these behaviors the status of law. The reason they can call these behaviors the laws of nature is because there are no known exceptions. Some examples of these are gravity, the laws of motion, and others. A law is an absolute rule. It is not possible for the material that makes up our universe to operate outside these laws of nature without cause. The only way a law of nature can be broken is by supernatural means. In other words, something or someone acting outside and independent of the laws of nature must cause matter to operate in a manner that's inconsistent with itself outside of its behavioral norm. Matter cannot cause itself to behave in a manner inconsistent with itself. Matter being that which makes up our universe. The law of gravity will not cause itself to stop working. The laws of motion will not cause themselves to stop affecting objects at rest or in motion. The laws of nature cannot change themselves. The laws of nature cannot be broken naturally. Number one, is the universe eternal? Let's define, let's define the word eternal to be something that has always been in existence and always will be in existence. An important element to consider in answering the question of whether or not the universal is eternal is found within the words that Paul used, the things that were made. Paul used these words by inspiration of God for a reason. Things that are made all possess one common characteristic for which we know of no exception. Things that are made are temporary. Things which are not temporary are eternal, meaning they have no beginning or ending. We do not know of any material thing, any material thing in our universe that is eternal in existence. The sun and the stars are all burning balls of gas which will sometime in the future be exhausted. Their fuel supplies will eventually be exhausted and their fires will eventually go out. Our sun gives us life. Without it we would perish from the earth in a very short period of time. Our sun is not permanent. It is using its own resources every day to sustain itself in its present state and that fuel that powers our sun is not being replenished. When that fuel runs out, it's over. Our sun cannot have been always in existence or the fuel which sustains it would have long since been exhausted. Our scientists, they all know this. They all know that the sun and the earth we live with are not permanent. They had a beginning and they will have an ending. Let's keep in mind that we are focusing on this from the perspective of someone living thousands of years ago. However, Looking at this from a scientific standpoint only reinforces the notion that if those who lived in the beginning had no excuse, we certainly don't either. In science, we have three laws called the laws of thermodynamics. Now science likes to use fancy words, but the meaning for this is very easy, very elementary. Thermo means heat and dynamic means power. So the laws of thermodynamics are nothing but the laws of heat power. As far as science can tell, these laws are absolute. All things in the observable universe are affected by and obey the laws of heat power with no known exceptions. We will be using the first two laws to answer the question of whether or not the universe is eternal. 
The first law of heat power is commonly known as the law of the conservation of energy. And it states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed in nature. The total quantity of energy in the universe remains the same. Now it can change from one form to another. For example, heat can change from motion to electricity to light. But the total amount of energy remains the same. There is a similar law called the law of conservation of matter which states that matter cannot be created or destroyed in a closed system although it may be arranged by the application of energy. The first law of heat power should therefore be combined with the law of the conservation of matter to state that the total amount of mass and energy in the universe remains constant. Matter and energy are interchangeable which brings us to the second law that we're going to look at this afternoon. The second law of heat power is commonly known as the law of increased entropy. Entropy is defined as a measure of unusable energy within a closed or isolated system. The universe, for example, is a closed system. As usable energy decreases and unusable energy increases, entropy increases. Simply stated, usable energy is constantly becoming less and less available in a closed system and it will eventually all run out. To illustrate this, think of the gas that powers our cars. The fuel burns and that energy is consumed. Once the fuel is burned, part of it is converted into unusable energy. All matter has energy. However, all energy is not usable. Once the usable energy has been exhausted, none remains. In the future, there will be no more gas for our cars. There will be no more coal to burn. There will be no more natural gas. And eventually there will be no more sunlight. All of the usable energy in the universe will have been exhausted. This is known as the law of increased entropy. And there are no exceptions. No known exceptions. It's all going to run out eventually. What this teaches us is that we live in a universe that had a beginning. It had a beginning. It had a moment in time from which all that we can observe had to be set in place and started. Modern science does not dispute this fact at all. It is accepted throughout the scientific community that our universe is not eternal meaning that it has not always existed. They know this and it makes them very uncomfortable. Why? Because we have just eliminated option number one. The universe is not eternal. And there is no way that you can get around it. What we have left is option number two and option number three. Since the universe is not eternal, then it either had to have been created or it created itself out of nothing. There are no other options to answer the question of the origin of the universe. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. God expected people who lived at the beginning of the creation to figure this out all by themselves. One does not have to be a 21st century rocket scientist to see this. It, it, it doesn't require... It's so simple. So what about option number two? The universe created itself out of nothing? At face value, one would think that that could be answered easily. We would have eliminated it and have only one option left, but science eager to explain away the existence of God have come up with numerous theories on how the universe might have been able to create itself. And every single one of them, as they go on, they come and they go, they come and they go. They have fallen by the wayside because of one inescapable fact. None of them can occur without violating the natural laws which govern the physics of the universe we live in today. And atheistic scientists have to prove a completely naturalistic origin of the universe. We have two major issues to contend with with option number two. First issue, the universe created itself. The second issue, out of nothing. Let's deal with nothing first. That's easy. There have been several theories out there in the, in the scientific community which try and explain how the universe got here. None of them claim that it was from nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why is that? Because nothing has no potential. 
It has no substance. If nothing exists in nature, nothing is possible. Our scientists know this, and their theories come awful close, but none of them have tried to explain how the universe came from absolutely nothing. If you hold your hand up, and you're not holding anything in your hand, let's say you've got nothing in your hand at the basic level, nothing, what are you going to have in your hand a hundred years from now if nobody puts anything in your hand? What are you going to have? Nothing. If nothing exists, then there's not anything that's capable of producing anything. If ever there were a time in our past when absolutely nothing existed, then nothing would now exist. Because nothing can create anything from itself. Something now exists. We can see it all around us. Something exists now. And nothing is incapable of creating anything. Therefore, something, something, or someone, has been in existence forever. Let me say that again. If ever there were a time in our distant past, however far back that you want to look, if ever there were a time that nothing existed, then nothing would now exist. Something or someone has been in existence forever. So how about the first issue? The universe created itself. In addition to the laws of heat power, we have the law of cause and effect. This law states that all material effects must have an adequate and preceding cause. A fly by itself landing on a book would not be an adequate cause to affect the falling of that book from a table. The cause must be adequate to accomplish the effect. And the cause must have preceded the effect in time. There is no such thing as a retroactive cause to an effect. In other words, the cause does, can never happen before. Modern science teaches that our universe had a beginning. So then what caused it to come into existence? If there was nothing in existence before the universe was caused, then what could have caused it? In order for there to be a cause, something had to exist before the universe did. This something had to have been greater than the universe, possessed more power than the sum total of all matter and energy which made up the universe. And from looking at the way the universe is ordered, possessed, ordered, he possessed or it possessed considerable intent and purpose in so doing. Notice I'm saying he. Look at the way the universe is organized. Look at how big it is. The effect is never greater than the cause. In a nutshell, if option number two is true, then the universe and everything in it had to have come from nothing without an adequate cause. Scientists know this too. Well, they don't like it. They know that nothing creates nothing but nothingness. They know that if our universe came about naturally, that at some point in time, nothing had to create something without cause. Option number two is eliminated. Why? Because it's impossible. And it shouldn't take a scientist to know this either. And when we eliminate the impossible, whatever remains must be the truth. Option number one, the universe is eternal, has been eliminated. Option number two, the universe created itself from absolutely nothing with no cause has been eliminated because it's impossible. It cannot happen within the laws that govern all matter. It cannot happen. It cannot be. There's only one left. And that's option number three. The universe was created. That's the only one of the original three options left. So then the next question in our search for the truth of the existence of God is who or what created the universe? The universe was created, so it was either created by a who or a what. A someone or a something. Let's look at what may have created the universe. We have already determined that nothing can create something with no cause. But what about those who say... Well, the universe was just in another form prior to this one. Okay, I'll bite. I'll go along with that. So what caused it to change forms and what caused it to come into existence? 
Because if it had to change forms, then it had an ending. So it was temporary, just like our universe is. Therefore, it had to have a beginning, just like our universe did. And in order to have that beginning, it had to have an adequate cause. We can go on and on and on back through as many hypothetical forms of universes that we want. But in the end, if the universe was created by something, then there has to be a first creation from nothing, with nothing, with no cause, if there's no God. That is an inescapable fact because every material thing in our universe now is temporary, meaning that it had a beginning somewhere, sometime. Our universe could not have been created by a what or a something and remain within the natural laws that govern the behavior of all material things because matter cannot create or cause itself to be created. Cannot be a what? So what about the who? If the universe could not have been created by something material, and we have eliminated that as one of the two options, and what remains must be the truth, then it has to be who. So now we have to determine the characteristics of who. The who that must have created the universe had to have certain characteristics in order for it to be capable of it or even qualify. So let's look at those characteristics. First, whoever created the universe had to be greater than the universe, powerful enough to cause it to come into existence, and intelligent enough to accomplish it. Second, whoever created the universe has to have pre-existed all matter. The implications of this are that whoever created the universe cannot be a material thing made of matter. He has to exist without form or substance and he has to be able to exist outside of our closed system universe. Third and last, whoever created the universe has to be an eternal being. In order to have created anything temporary within eternity, someone has to have lived who never had a beginning. In order for anything temporary to exist, something eternal has to have existed forever. This goes along with the statement that if ever there were a time that nothing existed, then nothing would now exist. Something exists now. Something, in this case it has to be someone, eternal, has to have existed forever. It's important to keep in mind that if someone who possessed all these characters did not exist, then it would be impossible for anything now to exist. In order for anything material to exist, something must exist with the intelligence, power, and ability to cause or create it. There's an unconfirmed story that Sir Isaac Newton had an atheist friend with whom he sp- that he used to debate the existence of God. They were great friends and they spent a lot of time together. And at one point in Newton's life he acquired one of those models of our solar system that is set up with a complex machinery that causes all the planets and their moons to rotate in their orbits around the sun, which is in the center. I've seen those (coughs) pictures of them. There's one at the Science Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. You turn the little crank, the little sun and the, the, the earth and the moons all rotate around the sun. The planets all rotate around the sun, or the, the, the moons all rotate around the planets, and the planets rotate around the sun. It's really neat. It's the same thing. Isaac Newton was quite proud of his little device, and when his atheist friend came over for a visit, Newton invited him in to see his working model of the solar system. Upon seeing the model in action, Newton's friend was quite enthusiastic about it, and he asked Newton who built it for him. Isaac Newton, always ready to make a point to his atheistic friend in favor of the existence of God, told him, nobody built that for me. It just happened. Naturally. Anyone can look at a model of the solar system and draw the conclusion that somebody had to build that. If the model had to have a builder, how much more so the real thing? If the model couldn't just happen, What makes anyone think the real thing, which is vastly more complex, could just happen accidentally from nothing either? 
This story, whether true or not, teaches us the basic concept that with intelligent design, there is understood the existence of an intelligent designer. When there is order, there is understood to be the existence of an organizer. If something is created, then there must be a creator. Our universe was created. There is no doubt about it, and scientists know it. They are still struggling with whether it was created by something or someone, and the only reason they are doing so is because they don't want to admit it. Now, to be fair to science in general, there have been several renowned scientists who have come forth and admitted that something is very wrong. And the naturalistic theories of the origin of the universe, big gun scientists who literally wrote some of the textbooks which outline many of the scientific theories used today, they have jumped ship because they have realized that there is no other possible or logical conclusion other than a creator that can be drawn from the facts. For this, they are ostracized from the scientific community, rejected as scholars, and treated like superstitious idiots. Their once famous names fade from memory and have been replaced by a new naturalist champions who tell the people what they want to hear. Once one admits there is a creator, what naturally follows is what does this creator expect? of me. People don't like expectations because that implies following someone else's will or direction. People don't want to accept the fact that there is a creator because they are uncomfortable with the concept of doing his will. Living by his direction and ordering their lives around his expectations. We stated earlier that if some material thing which had a beginning exists now that something which does not have a beginning and is not material in the sense we know it must have existed forever. If something is not material, then it must be immaterial or spiritual. Everything in the universe can be placed into one of two categories. One that we know exists, the other is in dispute. Matter and energy are interchangeable. So we can put them all together into one category. On the other side, we have that which the atheists dispute. We have all that is not material or made of matter. What is that? The answer is spirit or mind. Everything in the universe can be categorized as either mind or matter. Does spirit or the mind exist? outside of or independent of manner or energy. Is there any scientific evidence that mind exists or spirit or something outside of matter? Something that operates independent of matter. Is there any scientific evidence for that? Yep. A scientist by the name of John Eccles believed that our minds were independent of our material bodies During his life, he set out to prove or disprove this theory. During his studies and experimentations, he was able to determine that the human mind can display intent, purpose, and perception without ever showing a hint of brain activity. In other words, the human mind can have intent without ever firing a neuron. He was able to establish a dual existence within man's brain, and he called it man's mind. Basically, our minds operate similar to how a librarian operates within a library. A brother in the uh, brother in the in the in the field of apologetics came up with this. I think it's the best that I've ever seen analogy of this. Our brains are similar to how a librarian operates within a library. Our minds use our brains like a library uses like a librarian uses a library. It exists, works inside, and uses the brain, but it is not the brain. As one would imagine, there's a lot of controversy over his findings. However, it should be noted that John Eccles, that's E-C-C-L-E-S, received the Nobel Prize for Science, which lends a great deal of credibility to his findings. What this means to us is that he's hard to argue with. He wrote a book about it too. It's called How the Self Controls Its Brain. What this means to us is that there is some credible, 
research scientific evidence out there which points to the reality of a mind operating independently within a person's brain. That The significance of that cannot be overstated. It is scientifically proven fact. You don't read about that too much in your textbooks, do you? What a, what a coincidence. God says man was created in his image. Genesis 1.27 This was never said of the animals. God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.7 Again, this is never said of the animals. There is a dual existence within man. Mankind possesses something given to him by God which is different than anything any animal on earth received and at the same time is similar to something that is inherent with God or in His image. What is that? What is that? What, what did He give us that's in His image? Something with a capacity to hope, to have compassion, to aspire to understand and respect morality, know right from wrong, to reason and to live forever. We have a mind. God is a spiritual entity existing outside of our natural boundaries. There is nothing about Him that is material. Therefore, if He gave us something in His image, it cannot be a material thing. It has to be immaterial. We have something given to us by God that exists independently of our natural boundaries. Something exists today that is not eternal. In order for anything temporary to exist, something has to have, to have existed forever that is not material. What is it? Mind? Spirit? That great eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing mind. Bigger than the universe. Greater than than the universe, older than time itself, intelligent, extremely intelligent, powerful enough to create what we see around us from nothing, possessing compassion, love, knowing right from wrong, aspiration, and possessing the ability to reason. What some would call that great mind that great spirit, I prefer to call my God and Creator. We share something in common with the atheists. We all have faith in something. The atheists have faith that the universe got here naturally with no Creator. Well, if there's no Creator, matter and energy had to have created itself. If there is no Creator, then matter and energy, which have not always existed, had to have created itself from nothing with no cause. If there is no creator in this universe we live in and everything in it had to have just happened by accident with nothing to produce it, nothing to fuel it, guide it, direct it, or organize it. If there is no creator then at some point in time nothing had to create something with no cause. If there is no creator, then the laws of nature which govern all matter and energy had to be set aside naturally. Let me say that again. If there is no creator, then the laws of nature which govern all matter and energy had to be set aside naturally. Matter cannot change its own properties. It cannot set its own behavior aside. It does not possess that kind of ability. Imagine what a chaotic world we would live in now if such a thing were possible. If there is no creator, then the laws of nature which govern all matter and energy had to be set aside naturally. If there is no creator, then everything that exists in this universe had to happen by accident. If there is a creator, and there is, then the laws which govern matter and energy, which govern matter and energy was set in place when matter and energy were created. Both models, both models 
must work outside the natural laws. The universe can't get from nothing to something naturally. Both models have to work supernaturally. Both atheists and creationists have faith. Given the, ed given the evidence, it takes considerably more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a creationist. The atheists believe in creation outside the normal laws of nature with no explanation for cause. Christians believe in a creation outside the normal laws of nature with the only possible explanation for the cause. Now, whose faith is based on logical facts and not influenced by personal feelings? And whose faith is really subjective or based on feelings, attitudes, opinions, and whimsical hopes? Whose faith is really a sham and a crutch for a weak-minded person? Certainly not our faith in God. We've got the only explanation that can work. God exists and we can be sure of it. We can be more sure of His existence than the atheist can in His non-existence. He exists and we know it and we can be sure of it. And His existence is proclaimed loudly and plainly in the things which were made in the universe. The psalmist wrote, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. I would like to take just a moment. I'm not completely out of time yet. That word fool in the original language is a whole lot stronger than, than what we kind of think of it as today. <clears throat> That's pretty much the same thing as saying the idiot has said in his heart there is no God. Psalms 14.1 The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament sheweth His handiwork. Psalms 19.1 and indeed it does for all who will accept it and respond to the call. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for having us down here. Yes, we can be sure about the existence of God. You notice I didn't say anything at all about evolution. That's Dick's job. He'll take care of that and I'm sure he will do a fine job. I see him sitting back there in the back. This whole lectureship is about we can be sure. There is not a part of our faith that we cannot back up with overwhelming fact. That's right. Not one aspect. And I hope that you all will stay for the whole lectureship and I hope that everybody will be edified and strengthened. And again, thank you so much for having us up here. The lesson is yours. Thank you for your attention.